So, Colby. Yes. You ever wonder why we both grew up speaking English? Even though we're from countries in different hemispheres? That are nowhere near England. It's a mystery we may never... Oh, it's totally covered in another unit. Hi, I'm Colby Burnett, and along with Kim Lochner, we're introducing Unit 3, Industrialization. Political transformations shook the world in the late 18th century. The slave regime was overthrown in Haiti. The wars of independence occurred in the American colonies. Europe experienced the French Revolution. Together, these transformations ushered in new ideas about sovereignty, the rights of citizens, and our modern global system of nation states. But another dramatic, if more gradual, transformation was taking place at the same time. The story of this unit is about that transformation, the birth of the industrialized world. Political revolutions changed who was allowed to participate in government, but the industrial revolution changed everything about how humans lived and worked. This was due to a transformation in production and distribution, only equaled by our turn to farming thousands of years earlier. Most people living before industrialization did many things just like their ancestors had for generations. The majority were farmers or herders. What they produced was for themselves and for local consumption. And it was made in the home or in small workshops. Most of the energy to do all this work came from their own muscles, animals, or in some cases, water or wind. The ways that people worked and the things they made had in some cases changed over the preceding centuries. But these innovations were mostly small or gradual or geographically limited. The Industrial Revolution changed all of this, quickly in some places and more slowly in others. It began with the discovery of how to use fossil fuels, like coal and later oil, to power machines to do the work. The result was the development of so many aspects of modern life. This included big machines, factories, electricity, and mass transportation. All of these changes also allowed humans to build bigger and richer networks. Fossil fuels led to steamships and railroads, and later cars and airplanes to move people and goods. Electricity facilitated the development of new long distance communication systems, the telegraph, and later the telephone and the internet. These changes also transformed human communities. People moved from rural regions to cities in search of factory work. The model of an extended family in a large village broke down and was replaced by a nuclear family in a small apartment. While parents worked all day, schools emerged to train children to become workers. Both religion and government had to evolve to accommodate these kinds of changes. Some historians argue that the Industrial Revolution was the most important transformation in creating the world in which we now live. In this unit, we consider this argument by breaking it down and looking at the evidence. We ask, what was the cumulative impact of the Industrial Revolution and how was it experienced? Was the experience the same for everyone or did it differ based on class, gender, racial identity and geographic location? One way to begin to answer questions about the differing impacts of the Industrial Revolution is with data. Of course, we don't have complete sets of numerical data for this era, but we can combine the pieces we do have to get a picture of change. For example, industrialized countries could quickly create cheaper products. This meant they had more goods to export to other countries, and they could sell those goods much cheaper than local merchants and producers could. In this chart of exported goods, we see how exports from Britain rose dramatically as it industrialized. Before about 1750, exports from all parts of Britain, including the regions of England and Wales, weren't that high, although they were slowly growing. Then, in 1750, as Britain industrialized, exports suddenly skyrocketed. We can contrast that with Spain, the Netherlands, and France, which by 1800 hadn't really industrialized. These countries didn't see a big growth in exports. We can also look at the dramatic decrease in the percentage of people working as farmers, around 1800. This drop occurred in several European countries, including Britain and others that industrialized after it. 
This chart shows the percentage of people employed as farmers dropping quickly in Britain, around 1750, when their industrial revolution began. We can see the same change happening a little later in the Netherlands, Italy, and France as they industrialized. The change happened even later in Poland, which industrialized last among these countries. About 12% of Poland's people still work as farmers today. Finally, we can also see industrialization by looking at the growth of CO2 emissions from 1750 forward. These emissions came mostly from factories and other industrial sources. As we can see, emissions rose first in Western and Central Europe, especially in Britain. But it started slowly. Even in Britain, industrialization was still quite limited between 1750 and 1800. Then it began to rise more rapidly, and other parts of Europe and the United States began to industrialize. Other regions followed more gradually. Another way to understand the impact of industrialization is to zoom in a bit closer and look at change in specific regions. In this unit, we will examine many places in that way, including Britain, the United States, Japan, India, and Egypt. The transformations brought by industrialization look different in each of these regions. In Japan, for example, industrialization started late but when it started in the 1860s, it advanced rapidly. Before this period, Japan's government tried to limit the influence of foreign trade and ideas. Nagasaki was the only trading port legally open to foreign merchants. While Japan walled itself off, the Industrial Revolution was rapidly transforming other societies, like Britain. Beginning in the late 18th century, British industry had introduced steam-powered machines that produced cloth, textiles, at an enormous rate. This gave it a big trade advantage. New railroads and steam-powered ships allowed British goods to move a lot faster. Other advances followed, and a second wave of industrialisation began in new regions of the world. Countries on the European continent, as well as the United States, soon industrialised to compete with Britain. These countries not only adopted British innovations, but added their own in areas like industrial chemistry and electricity. So Japan missed out on the first wave of industrialization. It was also a latecomer to the second wave. The visit of a squadron of American steam-powered warships in 1853 changed this. The Japanese government was alarmed at the growing military superiority of industrialising states as evidenced by the American fleet. Soon, the Japanese government began to embrace change. They sponsored the study of science and industry with rapid results in some areas. Japan's first iron factory was built in Nagasaki in 1861. Five local men traveled to London to study British machinery and kick off the industrial transformation of Japan. Upon their return, they sparked an industrial revolution of their own. The pace of change was still quite slow in Japan. Some of the government resisted industrialization. Then, in 1868, a political upheaval led to new leadership and a system that favoured rapid modernization. This was the Meiji Restoration. Hirobumi Ito, one of the men who had travelled to London, became the first Prime Minister of the new Meiji government. Factories went up quickly, including naval yards and coal mines in and around Nagasaki. Peasants and fishermen were pulled into these factories as workers. The city had permanently transformed into an industrial centre. Change was not rapid everywhere in the world, nor for everyone. And it didn't only go in one direction. As you'll see in this unit, Egyptian industrialisation took off and then stalled. Some regions, like India, saw a decline in production during the Industrial Revolution. Imperialism, which we'll discuss in a later unit, played a big role in these regional differences. People living in the same place also experienced the Industrial Revolution differently. The wealthy generally benefited from it, but workers often paid the costs. Many workers lived in crowded conditions and laboured in filthy, dangerous jobs. Women's experiences were different from men's, and rural people different from those living in cities. But while these differences existed, nobody can deny that the global impact of the Industrial Revolution was vast. It was truly revolutionary. So much change. And in such a short time, my head is spinning.
but when your head spins, does it go in the opposite direction? Oh my god, I thought we said no more Australia jokes. 